friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise and I sweat an emulsion. That's why I'm so soft. For you snake owners out there, how many times have you handed a snake to someone who has never held a snake before and heard them marvel, I thought it'd be slimy? Which I'm going to guess is followed by an explanation by you that snakes being slimy is a myth and they are not slimy at all. Sound familiar? Well, guess what? You lied. Snakes actually do have slimy skin. They have to. Surprised? Yeah, me too. Let's dive in. So let's start with that oozy, slimy skin. Snake skin and scales are an absolute marvel of evolution. Not only does it provide the perfect canvas for some of nature's most incredible works of art, not only does it provide protection with scaly armor, not only does it keep the insides inside and the outside outside, but it is also integral to effective locomotion. Without scales, particularly ventral or stomach scales, snakes would have a much harder time getting around. If you didn't know, there are six different ways snakes move. You can find out all about them here. And scales are really important in most, if not all of them. Skin's got a big job to do. And to understand how it does this, we need to look at the structure of the skin and how it does seemingly conflicting tasks, like being rigid, but flexible. The secret is how these scales attach to the underlying skin. I covered this in detail in my video on how snakes can swallow such huge meals. Basically, the scales made out of keratin, the same protein found in our nails or our hair, are rigid and hard but the skin the scales attach to is quite stretchy. A section of each scale is kind of left unattached to the skin. The skin on the inner part of the scale hinges back on itself, making a little pocket of skin, which attaches to the outer part of the scale beneath it, creating an interlocking sheet of protective armor that can stretch an impressive amount thanks to those little bits of extra skin at each scale. Flexible and rigid. Win-win, right? Yeah, sure, the skin may stretch and move, but those scales, once fully formed, don't grow. Snakes also don't grow additional scales. Barring injury, a snake dies with the exact same number of scales that they were born with. So if they can't add new scales and the scales themselves don't grow, how can a baby snake like this baby Macklet's python grow to be this big and still be fully covered in scales? Well, the real skinny on snake skin is what goes on under the surface. And for that, we need to journey through the layers of the epidermis. That's science talk for skin, if you didn't know. The outermost layer is called the stratum corneum. Stratum is Latin for layer and corneum meaning of horn, so horny layer. Sometimes it's considered to be a sublayer of the stratum externum, but I'll get to that in a second. This is the layer that is ultimately shed during the ichthysis or shedding process. The cells in this layer are dead and filled with keratin, which form that tough protective barrier. Under that layer, like just under that, like so, just under that it might be one and the same as I mentioned a second ago, is the stratum externum outer layer, which is weird because it's under the horny layer, so it's not really outer, it's like the inner outer layer. Words are weird. This layer, oh my goodness, did you get startled? Oh, don't touch the mic. Hi, Do you, are you mad we took you out of your court ground? She's like, I was sleeping and you woke me up. You stole me from my home. Don't go through my belt loops. One belt loop later. This layer consists of fully matured cells that have completed their journey from the layers underneath. The cells here are flattened and keratinized, providing strength and protection to the skin. Hi. <laughs> He's like, hello, <laughs> can you tell I'm upset with this surface? <laughs> Next one down is the stratum intermedium, intermediate layer, which contains cells that are in the process of maturing and moving toward the outer surface of the skin. Then you have the basal layer, Stratum germinativum. Germinativum from the word germinate to create or develop. 
This is the innermost layer of the epidermis, closest to the underlying dermis. This layer is responsible for cell division and the generation of new skin cells. The cells gradually move towards the surface, pushing the older cells upwards. Within this layer, there are specialized structures called dermal papillae. Papillae. Papillae however you want to say it, which are small nubby projections within the skin that influence the arrangement and growth of the scales. As new cells are produced and move toward the surface, they interact with the dermal papillae, guiding the formation of new scales. So that's the basics. New skin and scales are built way down. Well, okay, I say way down, but really we're talking a few hundred microns down, but new cells are created and pushed upwards, maturing and developing until they are ready to usurp the old, beat up top layer and the snake goes through the shedding process, ecdysis, which is triggered for a few reasons. Oh, we're getting mad. <laughs> The primary one, especially when the snake is young, is growth. As mentioned earlier, the scales don't grow. So as the snake gets bigger, they need to replace the old skin and scales with new skin and ever so slightly bigger scales. There's also refreshing the paint. Over time, a snake skin accumulates damage from various environmental factors such as abrasions, scratches, bites, and or exposure to the elements. Shedding provides a mechanism for the snake to get rid of this damaged skin. It can be for the removal of external parasites like mites. As the old skin is sloughed off, unwanted hitchhikers are left behind with it, helping to keep the parasite load lower and reducing the chance of a serious infestation. Lastly, ichthysis is triggered to maintain proper hydration levels. The outer layer of the skin can become less permeable as it ages, and shedding allows the snake to remove this less permeable layer, promoting better water absorption through the skin. In essence, the shedding process is an essential adaptation that allows snakes to accommodate growth, maintain skin health, and address environmental Environmental challenges, and it is a fascinating process. If you keep snakes, you probably know that the first sign that shedding is on the horizon, and you should give your snake a hand by increasing your snake's humidity, is when the snake starts going into blue. This is caused by the presence of a secreted fluid between the old and new layers of skin. This fluid causes the snake's colors to start to become dull, progressing to a grayish bluish color over the entirety of the body and its eyes, which take on a cloudy bluish hue, which is called, are you ready for this? The Ecdysis Veil. Sounds pretty sinister, yeah? Kind of sounds like a band name that my sister would listen to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not only does this give spooky zombie vibes, but it also makes your snake temporarily blind. Well, not blind blind, but like, okay, imagine trying to navigate a maze with super fogged up glasses and you can sort of make out the shapes right in front of you and you know, any, like the, any changes in light probably, but you'd be pretty hard pressed to know exactly what's going on especially if you are used to being able to see things good and do other things good too. So with effectively losing sight, it should be no surprise that for many snakes, they get a little more nervous or jumpy when in blue and might appreciate you not bugging them during this time. Every snake is different. Tassara, one of my Doomroll's boas, sure seems very nervous when she's in shed. A big corn snake dozer is the opposite and acts exactly the same when in blue as he does normally, which is, he's good all the time. It's not like he's just always super nervous or grumpy. He's a good boy at all times. He just doesn't seem to care at all. Both Hobbs and his mate Callie don't get nervous, but they both seem a lot grumpier and really don't like being touched. You kind of get the whole, don't touch me, little twitches when you try and touch them when they're in shed to like push you away with his body. Know what your snake likes and doesn't like and act accordingly, yeah? Just be aware that it's a good practice in general to leave your snake alone during ecdysis. And don't be alarmed if they refuse food or they spend more time hiding or digging. It's cool and it's totally normal. Cool and normal. After a bit of time in blue, which might be a few days, might be upwards of a week. It depends on the snake and the humidity levels. The bluish tinge will usually fade and the eyes will clear up. Your snake may look pretty much normal for a day or two. And then they'll decide that the old coat has got to go. And they'll start rubbing their face on a rough bit of wood or rock to split the skin near the mouth and then the snake starts to crawl out of its old skin kind of like rolling off of a sock rolling off a sock not rolling off of a sock 
kind of like rolling off a sock, you know? Once complete, the snake emerges looking sleek and stylish, ready to slither into the sunset. It's the ultimate glow up. Oh, incidentally, you may see or hear folks giving other folks the gears if they help their snake shed. I get the sentiment, but there is absolutely no harm in helping your snake shed as long as they have begun the shedding process on their own. You should never pick at a snake's skin to initiate shedding. They might not be ready and you could hurt your snake, but if the snake has already initiated the shed, the whole skin is ready to go. Some lizards will often shed in patches over a short period of time, but snakes should go all at once, all in one piece. You holding your snake or pulling slightly with a little pressure while they slither out of their old skin is really no different than them using a rock or a branch in their enclosure to do the exact same thing. So if you see B-roll in this video of me helping one of my snakes shed, not that they need it, or someone else on the internet doing the same thing. It's cool, you don't need to chastise or you know, cancel anyone. No one is hurting their snake by doing this. It's okay. You should also know that a snake's shed is not a reliable way of measuring a snake's length. Snake skin is stretchy on the snake and it's stretchy off the snake too. The lynch isn't helpful. And that's especially true when it's fresh. It can be significantly longer than the snake actually is. And here's an example. This this is Hobbs's most recent shed. A couple days after shedding, it was 10 feet, 10 inches long, give or take. Now, Hobbs is a big fella, but he is not 11 feet. At eight, nine, eight, ten. His shed is more than 23% longer than he is. Now, you might think that knowing this metric, you could calculate the snake's length by doing the math. But first of all, why would you put yourself through that? The math is not good. But second of all, over time, the skin will dry out and constrict and could ultimately end up being significantly shorter than the snake actually is. No good, eh? Measuring snakes is tricky. They usually don't want to stay still long enough to whip out the old tape measure. And even if they do, they often don't lay straight. So I use a site called Serp Widget, which lets you calculate the length with an overhead picture of your snake along with something of known length, like a ruler. It's, it works pretty great and I'll have a link below. Now, the separation of the old skin from the new is facilitated by the production of a fancy secretion that I mentioned earlier. It is produced by subdermal glands and is made up of a mixture of lipids and enzymes and other substances and serves several purposes. It helps to soften the old skin, making it more pliable and easier to shed. It helps lubricate the skin layers, reducing the chances that the old skin is gonna stick to the new one. This is especially important around the mouth and the eyes. And helps reduce friction as the snake maneuvers its body to slough off the old skin. This slippery fluid, called ictisal fluid by the way, is crucial to the shedding process. And it is slimy. And I bet some of you clever folks out there saw my title and thumbnail and said to yourself, I bet she's talking about ictisal fluid. Smart, but also wrong. That's not the slime I'm talking about. I'm talking about 100% of the time total body covering of slime. Every snake, full stop. But how? Imagine you're a snake, living on the ground and moving without arms or legs to lift up your body. Your dry, smooth skin constantly rubbing against things and some of those things are going to be pretty rough and sharp, yeah? Rocks, sand, sticks, gravel, rough stuff. What happens when you rub something smooth on something really rough? You end up with two rough things pretty darn quick, don't you? So, Hobbs here, having shed three-ish weeks ago and constantly climbing on rough stuff in his home, his scales, especially his belly or ventral scales, should be pretty rough and worn out, right? Hmm, let's see. Oh, good boy. Uh, no, they are smooth as an android's bottom. There must be something else going on to help lubricate Hobbs as he moves about. And that is the question that Dr. Tobias Widener and his team set out to figure out. As a chemist, Dr. Widener had some methods, techniques, and tools, including laser spectroscopy and an electron microscope technique that probes the chemistry of the surface by knocking electrons out of it with x-rays. 
I don't know what any of this means, but I do know that what they discovered is that snakes are covered head to toe. Okay, well not head to toe, they didn't discover that snakes have toes. You know what I mean. They are completely covered in a thin, oily lipid layer. They're slimy. But how did we not notice this? I've held literally hundreds of snakes. Unless they were just in the water or just came into the world, they were all dry. You Google, are snakes slimy? And you will see page after page explaining how snakes being slimy is a myth. I've told countless kids at live shows for birthday parties and summer camps that snakes aren't slimy. Snakes are dry. So what is this guy on about? Well, this lipid layer is so thin we're talking, oh hi, we're talking one or two nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth, a billionth of a meter. And for my American friends, a meter is a few inches longer than a yard. Just to give you some context, a sphere with the diameter of one nanometer is to a softball as a softball is to the entire planet Earth. The layer is so small. So small, in fact, that any that comes off is nothing compared to the relatively copious amounts of disgusting ooze we humans secrete from our dry hands. It's imperceptible. Researchers also found this composition of lipid layer and how it is organized varies from species to species. For most snakes, the general arrangement is to have the lipids highly organized, like all lining up in the same direction and densely packed on the belly scales, which provides better lubrication and protection against wear compared to the more diffused, haphazardly arranged lipid layer on the back. But this variegated arrangement wasn't present in all snakes. The molecules of the lipid layer on fossorial snakes, like sand boas, like Sherman the worm in here who desperately needs to go on a diet, were tightly packed and uniformly arranged across the entire snake. Whole body, not just the stomach scales, the back, the sides, all of it. Which actually does make a lot of sense. As they often move through their environment as opposed to across it, they encounter friction over their entire body, not just their belly. So having better lubrication all over is going to be very beneficial. But no matter the arrangement, snakes are slimy. Well, okay, let's say nano slimy. At the end of the day, from a perception standpoint, anyone touching a snake will describe it as dry, and that's a-okay. But you, now armed with this largely unknown tidbit of information, would be forgiven for having a little smirk you keep to yourself when your non-snaky friend holds your snake for the first time and they exclaim, I thought it'd be slimy. It's okay. It can be our little secret. Right, Sherman? So there you go. I don't know. I have no idea if this video will do well. It's pretty obscure, but I think it was pretty cool. I'm excited to hear more as further research is done, finding out what these lipids are actually made of, human applications for this nanoscopic method of reducing wear and tear on moving parts. It's been hypothesized that this layer may also play a role in snakes' communication via scent, like a snake's version of Bia. What about aquatic snakes? How does this apply to them? All sorts of stuff still to research and learn. Thanks so much for watching. Please like the video if you thought it was all right. Um, whoops, I forgot to write a bit for my patrons. I'm so sorry. All right, I will try to do this off the cuff. <clears throat> Thank you so much to my patrons. These guys here are in my top tiers. These folks help me out so much and I couldn't do all this without your support. You guys are really awesome. Please check out patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl if you'd like to lend your support. Thanks again for all of you watching me yammer on for 15 to 20 minutes on a weird reptile topic. And until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye!